Good morning. Let the daily gospel begin. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we dedicate our lives to you today that we may live just a wonderful day and be victorious. Just give you glory and thanks, Lord, for testimonies that we acquire throughout our lives, Lord. Let our testimony treasure chest be full of testimonies that glorifies you and give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen. We're at chapter 17 of Book of Acts as we continue and we observed how Paul is preaching the gospel today. Verse 17. Therefore he Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentiles worshiper and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. Okay, it's not famous enough to draw a crowd yet, but uh, whoever is there is now ministering to. Now, then verse 18, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others say, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and Jesus of uh, the resurrection of Jesus. So the Anast Anastasia resurrection of Jesus, they thought it was the wife of Jesus. Remember resurrection of Jesus? Anastasia, Anastasis of Jesus. And so they thought it was a foreign God. Um, that's interesting. Romans 1, 14 through 16, it reads, I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. This is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Wow. Wow. Paul was a man who had genuine conviction the gospel of Jesus Christ was the truth that everyone needs to hear. He believed that Christ could have saved people from their sins. So we find in Athens, Apostle Paul preaching both in synagogue for Jews and the world people for marketplace. Jews in the synagogue, Gentiles in the marketplace, and it's interesting. When he went there, he saw a city full of idols, and he was outraged, and now he's given a chance. Uh, and it was illegal for uh, people to preach unregistered God in Athens, so that you would have to register your God. So we'll, we'll soon see why Paul uses the tactic addressing, oh, I see that you are worshiping God, unknown God. So, you know, where his starting point picks up from the God called unknown God. I don't know how many gods they had registered in Athens at the time, but when I was visiting India, they said officially in India, they have 330 million gods registered in India. <laughs> so you could go to India and call whatever you want, God, then pretty much you're covered, you know. You could call camel god, fly god, dung beetle god, whatever. 330 million gods in India. Well, I don't think Athens had that many. But including all the idols and all the statues. And if it's registered god in Athens, then you could kind of talk about it in the public arena. So that's what Apostle Paul did. You know, the thing about idol worship like, let's say you're holding on to this. This is my idol. This is my idol. A lot of times, it's not that easy to get it off of your hand. I'll take it away. I'll tell you why this is not good. And Because you hold on even tighter. Instead, tell them, 
to grab this instead of like working on letting it go. What about this? And then they said, oh, okay. They will let go in order to grab. So gospel presentation is like that. Don't try to argue against Buddhism that they hold on to. Present the gospel, right? Uh, one of the key leaders in Cambodia, great statesman, wonderful pastor. He one time complained to me, why is it that Korean missionaries come and argue against Buddhism? We're a Buddhist nation. Don't argue against Buddhism. Just preach the gospel. Let them choose gospel. And many years later, they will become Christian nations like Korea is supposedly 25% Christian when it was 0% Christian. I said, that's, that's true. So gospel, we give it to them as an option so that they could choose instead of hold on to whatever they hold on to. So that's what Paul is doing. Here it is. It's the gospel. Oh, you serve unknown God. The name is unknown God. Well, let me tell you something about God. But uh, Athens at the time, uh, two strong philosophical schools were in operation. Of course, you know, you know, Greek philosophy started with Socrates and his disciple Plato started a school called Ac Academy of Plato. And then his disciple Aristotle decided to go against Plato and uh, Lyceum of Aristotle started, and then Porch of Zeno and Garden of Epicurus began. So it is written here that people from these two traditions met them and said, wow, this is interesting. Why don't you come and speak to us? That's why we met two Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in verse 18. So it, it's historically correct. Historically, that's what the two schools that was fighting each other. Epicureans were very individualistic, sort of like rugged individualism of America. And it was very pleasure oriented because who cares if there is God? There's no absolute, it's about flesh. It's about being very liberal in their thinking. And it, it, it was their pursuit. The Stoics, in the other hand, was very conservative. They were, uh, in a way, fundamental. They were um, nature-oriented uh, and pantheism, sort of like, you know, what is nature? What is the nature of the universe? And, and they would talk about that. They would debate that. And, and it was intellectual group. Well, Epicureans, too, but totally different. You know, it's just like someone I met many, many years ago as I was doing premarital counseling. And she said, I made a commitment. If it's not fun, I'll never do it. I want my marriage to be fun. So I said, sister, marriage is not supposed to be fun. You know, it's a commitment. Um, yeah, sometimes marriage cannot be fun. I mean, that's how we grow through suffering, character spills. She said, oh no, I'm just gonna, everything to be fun, 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 fun. Of course, their marriage didn't survive. So, you know, we know that <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, Part of marriage is fun and that's great, but that's not the core, that's not the motivation to marry somebody. So the whole Epicurean said, well, if it's not pleasurable, I don't want to do it. That's our philosophy. Stoics were more stoic. And that's why we say, oh, are you stoic, right? So, uh, so the whole thing about the resurrection though, both of them misunderstood because when he said the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they thought he was talking about Anastasis of Jesus, Christos. They thought, oh, he's talking about the, the wife, of God, wife of Jesus as goddess. So they really uh, wanted to learn about them. And, and that's interesting. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new doctrine of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Wow, that's interesting, huh? For all the Athenians and the foreigners who are there spend their entire time, nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some New things, they're all into new stuff. It's sort of like the environment, sort of like Berkeley philosophy department. Yeah, these are the guys that spend entire day just, you know, 
talking about new stuff, new theory, new philosophy, and new take on Martin Heidegger. On and on and so forth. So, at, at to a certain point, that they're not even interested in truth. They simply want to find out, entertain their mind about new concept because it, they're just intellectually high. It's like almost like a drug, right? And so, and that's the limitation of philosophy. If you're not really seeking truth through philosophy, and if philosophy is your destination, then you're making a great error. Philosophy is a means. Philosophy you use, philosophy is a tool to encounter the truth, encounter Christ. And, you know, I did a whole book talk on Jesus Christ, the greatest philosopher. So if you have a question about my take on philosophy, search it out, you know, and then, and then uh, listen to it because I'm not anti-philosophy as a believer. Matter of fact, I think we should be the greatest philosophers because our Jesus is the greatest philosopher who ever lived, right? But here we're finding now Paul addressing this unknown God is written as agnostos, where we get the agnostics, right? So gospel is now being preached and Paul stood and man, he's like, He's going to let them have it. I mean, you even worship this agnostos, unknown God, right? And so he qualified himself to be able to address Athens because otherwise they may start a riot. So, oh, he's now preaching unregistered God. So he says, no, he starts his whole talk from the registered God name, unknown God. They have so many gods that they even had a name called unknown God in Athens. So, I said, good for you, Paul, preach the gospel and, and let them have it. <laughs> you know, I, I just uh, cutting it short a little bit, just about two, three minutes, because some of you uh, have been praying for us and Arata project, the $400,000 $400, project. And we just, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, gave testimony when we came. Uh, someone donated 170,000, and that's just like so amazing. And people gave like 10,000, 20,000, you know, 2,000. And I mean, my gosh, uh, 100,000 were filled. So we had 270,000, which is, we, we didn't think it was going to happen like that. We actually, Jenny and I, we were actually <laughs> uh, even thinking about put our house on sale and, and, if the difference that we could we could maybe make the difference and and things like that it was our plan B, honestly to to speak to you honestly, but uh, two days ago as we were the Saturday night where I was it was around eight p.m. so it was like ten p.m. Ohio time I think my friend from Ohio <clears throat> wrote to me through email Pastor O why is it that Lord's burdening my heart. Uh, about you and to support you. Do you have any need? He said, oh, well, yeah, you know, we're hoping that, you know, first week of August when we go back, that if we could just pay up all the buildings uh, and meet our Arata building project, 400,000, it'd be fantastic. But what we're at 275,000 strong. So praise the Lord, it's a miracle. Next morning, I got an email. He said, well, my wife and I prayed about it. Uh, we, we decide to support you $125,000. <laughs> That's unbelievable. So we already met our $400,000. I just, I just want to take pause uh, to let you know that when God moves and God does his thing, I mean, my plan B, my plan C, just is, it was irrelevant because God said, I'll provide, and God did, so that we could continue on with the gospel work in Cambodia, in Jesus' name. Amen, rejoice with us. Hallelujah, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. You are good, you are God. We worship you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. I send you up with holy kiss. Mwah. See you tomorrow.